Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Uh, uh, welcome to the Horasis uh, U.S. Meet. Uh, uh, I'm, my name is Neera Charan. I'm very honored to be chairing this panel of such uh, global thought leaders across faces I see on my screen. Uh, I think uh, the next 45 minutes, we'll have some good conversation and insights around the supply chain that we've talked about. I think now, very quickly, I don't think we've had a, we could have had a more burning issue than what we have on this panel about the supply chain. Um, uh, Harass has talked about the trade wars, Harass has talked about COVID, and sadly enough, we have the Russia-Ukraine conflict as we speak at this point, and all of it is going to have a very long determined impact as we go forward. Uh, you know, some thoughts that come to my mind to kickstart this panel is that a lot of people have been saying for a long time that the global economy has been overtly reliant on lean production and the global economy has been overtly reliant on faraway factories, maybe, and the logistics has been a nightmare. And over time, it has just gone, gone up and up and up. Uh, a, a typical sea container takes 20% more time door to door. And so this leads me to two very teaser questions for this panel is, uh, are we going to see a uh, renewed trade confrontation as we move forward? And are we going to see a, a push towards moving locations, production locations that are closer, both geographically and politically? So there are new words people talk about reshoring. So I'm going to leave all that thoughts to 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 you experts um, because you know we have. So I'm going to start with Saurabh. Uh, thank you for being on the panel, Saurabh. Saurabh is a partner and head of strategy at the Longevity Vision Fund, uh, biomedical breakthroughs, investments in healthcare and life sciences. Uh, you are a biotech innovator, entrepreneur. You started multiple. You're being a serial entrepreneur. Uh, with um, all kinds of work around the world. Uh, the resume is long, but I know people are aware of some of the work you've done. So, Saurabh, let me start with you. Uh, we talk of trade wars all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I feel that trade wars at some level really is about the future of innovation. And, and we talk about the trade wars, but it's actually in some ways the future of innovation. Um, what do you think about this? Yeah, and, and first of all, thank you and, and the organizers for having me here. It's great to be back at Horasis and, and sharing some of the thoughts, especially during such a critical time, I think just uh, uh, geopolitically and globally. Um, so yeah, you know, trade wars really are about the future of innovation. And unfortunately, you know, these things are, are, are really limiting uh, innovation and then also collaboration globally. Uh, and the rising population of isolationist policies, as well as geopolitical arguments, creating these trade wars, most notably between the U.S. and China, and escalating tariffs and trade sanctions can really strain the financial markets. And more importantly, it's a huge step back for globalization. So in particular, what's happening between U.S. and China and each, or each country uh, posturing to limit the amount of business relations of the other, and in addition, investing heavily into high-tech innovation like AI, EV, biotech, and healthcare, e-commerce, digital, just in an effort to uh, grow the fastest growing segments of their economy. And what's really missed here is the opportunity for collaboration. So while the U.S. is notable for fostering innovation and incubating innovation, China really can succeed by scaling. So really, you know, there's a lot of synergy there that just isn't realized and really never will be realized until these governments can um, uh, stop precluding true collaboration. And it's really a missed opportunity for both sides. And like you mentioned, I, I am an investor and entrepreneur in the biotech, healthcare, and more importantly, longevity space. And tying it back to longevity, you know, we're seeing a lot of these uh, arms races, space races, and you know, trade wars and things like that. And I really do see this spilling over to healthcare and longevity sectors. You know, so while boosting GDP through investments and innovation can really bolster an economy, extending healthy lifespan and thereby the entire workforce and, and the working potential of an entire company can have even bigger and larger compound, uh, uh, compounding effects. And there's a study that came out um, not too long ago from Dr. David Sinclair of Harvard University and Andrew Scott of London Business School, showing that an increase in lifespan of just one year in the U.S. could add $38 trillion 
the economy, and that would more than double the current U.S. GDP, and then even more than that, add $167 million to the economy over 10 years. So even after the arms races and, and space race and trade wars and all these other things, um, definitely see that this is going to spill over into biotech and healthcare and even uh, really incentivizing government uh, to um, uh, take care of the longevity and lifespan of their people. Thank you, Saurabh. Did you say thirty-eight trillion? Is that what you said? Thirty-eight trillion. Yeah, is the uh, projection, and I think yeah. Last I checked, uh, GDP of the U.S. Uh, somewhere around twenty-four, uh, a little above twenty-four. So um, yeah, and that's just one year, right? So if it's more than one year, uh, that can that can scale uh, much larger. So you know, again, I I have a dog in this fight, and I'm I'm biased, but I do want to support more investments into longevity and tree aging as a community. No, thank you. That was, that's a mind-boggling number, sir. Thirty trillion is crazy, but you know, I'm short. Thank you. We'll get back to you with some more questions later. Uh, I move on to Deborah. Deborah Weins, Weinswig is the CEO and founder of Corsight Research, and um, I, I think uh, you would have some more insights because you're talking about a research and advisory firm that focuses on the intersection of retail and technology, or advising companies around at this time to anticipate change and profit from disruption. And that's what we are seeing at this time. Uh, Deborah, you've been uh, a known face and name on various TV channels, New York Times, Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera. So you've had a long history of having done a lot of work in Hong Kong, uh, in the United States. So uh, uh, let me start with the most first thing that the, the topic said that, uh, how do you see the U.S.-China uh, trade conflict that has been building up over the past couple of years pan out? Uh, how real and how long you think this is? Or are we going to see some some things coming up differently? Politically is one thing, commercially is another thing. So your first thoughts on that, Deborah. So let's start with, and first of all, thank you, and to the distinguished panelists as well. This is really fantastic to have this opportunity to, to talk with everybody. It was fascinating. So we were asked by one of our clients for holiday 21 to find new manufacturing capacity for them in the United States. We looked at some of the major cities. Detroit came to mind. I will say, you know, people of Detroit were incredibly helpful. So we found the capacity. Bring it to the client, and they're like, uh, you know, we could have union issues, we could have all of these kinds of things. And so while I think at the, you know, there is this desire theoretically to onshore, we still see much of it kind of offshore. And over the past two years with some of the critical infrastructure environment, you know, investments made in the China environment, I would say that their efficiencies have continued to outpace much of the rest of the world. And that while there is this kind of theoretical desire to kind of onshore, nearshore, that as we are seeing significant inflation around the world um, in pretty much every raw material and input, that efficiency and right trying to figure out how to cut costs, be more kind of, you know, this idea around looking at the supply chain as a whole. And so I know that there was someone who said, you know, how do you define supply chain? I mean, it's, it's from kind of, you know, the, you know, field, you know, the cotton field, if you will, to the consumer and everything in between. And so as we look at the kind of raw materials, where they're pre-positioned, the price and whatnot, I think that the world as a whole will continue to utilize. I mean, China used to be the world supply chain. We have seen over the past, let's call it five years, certainly movement into you know, many other geos, including we've had, you know, in the past 12 to 18 months, we've heard a lot of movement into Africa and Egypt. But still, at the end of the day, I think that we will rely on China as a very significant contributor, especially as, like I said, this infrastructure investment so that it's more efficient, more, you know, it's it's less expensive and, you know, you're continuing to see improvement in quality. So I, I feel that there's been a lot of talk about change. At the same time, we may see some of the capacity that moved out of China even return there in the near term. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, back to you with more questions and more insights for something more related there. Uh, Dr. George Wang, good to see you. Good to see you back. 
Uh, yeah, that's the CEO too. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. George Wang is the founder and CEO of EBI International based out of Portland, Oregon. And he's been a leading uh, uh, leadership on the concurrent engineering and manufacturing outsourcing using AI. And I'm going to ask you a question on the AI part. I'm very intrigued with that part. Mm -hmm. uh, before launching EBI, of course, you've had uh, business development. So you've been given a lot of awards around the world. Uh, you, you're a PhD in electronics engineering. So uh, since a lot of this is about the United States at this point, uh, a lot of people are talked about, and Deborah just touched upon it, and about uh, reshoring and you know whether you, the United States manufacturing, uh, how it's going. So, what is the landscape of the United States manufacturing in the decades ahead? If I had to ask you, and and, and in particular, uh, do you see any particular verticals where you see a more bigger push in the U.S. manufacturing uh, as we go forward? Yeah, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, follow up, uh, Deborah talking about what's happening. We have uh, hundreds of our clients with uh, almost 30,000 different kind of products that we've been uh, managing. Uh, about or 60% for the US and Canada clients, and then the resident for Europe or every country, even. Uh, uh, Singapore, you know, Malaysia, and Africa. So, so we see that firsthand every day what's happening. Yeah, on the manufacturing and the supply chain. So, I think right now it's really a hot topic that pretty much every clients, the major ones, you know, larger corporation, they are asking for a made in U.S solution and we work out made in us solution and then uh, okay secondary made in mexico solution and then the last one made in china solution it's like no 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 <laughs> that's a made in china e all the politicians kind of a, and and then uh, uh you know for the business wise we also have india we have operation there and and uh, Vietnam. So, so the uh, in the last four years, you know, several years, and then in the last two years that be the pandemic. Nobody can go anywhere. So we see a lot of uh, call, and that creates a lot of work for making the quote. And you know what? Every company has a buyer. And the GSM, you know what do they do? Cost analysis on the pennies level. What's another way of this? Whoever is the lowest cost, right? So, so that's a reality every day. But every day in a big meeting, we talk about it. Actually, then they look at the cost, you know, so trying to diverse the supply chain to uh uh, even go back to not, not go back to the US yet, go back to Taiwan, go back to uh, uh, <laughs> you know Mexico. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, every, everybody else got a twenty five percent of a bonus, <laughs> uh, extra money because, because compared with the, from China, they have this uh, tariff thing. Then. Uh, uh, so China's price have to be 25% cheaper and made in Vietnam and made in India or so a lot of pressure for China but then for made in the US portion uh, I think right now uh, the first group of the business would be those guys who can pay the bill right government jobs military related jobs we were willing to pay that price then the then the of course the high tech sector but then for the, for all these others money is still the number one unless you got a got a cheaper call and 
don't even mention the delivery, right? The schedule here, we have a hard time to have any, we have some simple assembly job with 3PL done, but it's so delayed. That's still a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, you touched upon a reality, uh, George, that no matter what people talk in boardrooms and discussions, when mm -hmm. it comes to that penny, which yeah. is a result of uh, cost efficacies and innovation as well, mm -hmm. it's not just a simple equation, then it tends to be um, asking for the most efficient offering on the table, wherever it comes from. Yeah. Uh, for a short time, we can have barriers, but long term, the economy finds its own way, water finds its own way to flow. So that's a good a good point. And so uh, I move can on I, can to- Can I actually add, add one thing? I think sure, that- sure. sure, I think that, you know, George brought up an excellent point around, you know, kind of challenges of, you know, kind of made in, in some geographies. And what we're seeing is in some cases made, let's say in China and assembled in the US. And so there, has, I have to say the amount of innovation, right, and in supply chain and logistics has been truly unbelievable. And then we're actually seeing more on-demand manufacturing in the United States as well. And this idea that, you know, as there, there are a lot of challenges around sustainability and ESG, you know, if you kind of make it as the orders come in, but that would be very kind of small MOQ. <coughs> but we are starting to see some really interesting ways to rethink the entire supply chain with a little bit more being done in the US, but ultimately, you know, kind of still, you know, looking at, once I said, again, I agree with George completely, it is all. Yeah. There's a bidding uh, process. Don't forget that. You go talk <laughs> to Walmart, you go talk to uh, Costco, look at their yeah. price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a reality. That's a reality. That's Unless right. somebody can say, okay, you are 30% higher, I'm going to buy from you. That's the trigger, right? That's so who trigger. is going to do that? That's the yeah. the minute you can find that clients. Great, luck you. Great, luck you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good that's a good point. And thanks for uh, thanks, Deborah, for pitching in and adding those points about how to assemble in the United States. Also, part of the new business. So, move on to David Smith. You know, he's been the founder, visionary of uh, Zant Strasset. And uh, Marilyn, is that where you are? And, yes, and, and I know that you've been an ex, uh, uh, industry leader in uh, information technology, satellite communication. And I think you are one of the guys amongst us who's worked the most with all the federal agencies. You've worked with the Naval Air Systems. You've worked with Drug Enforcement, uh, the Enforcement Directorate, U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Defense, Homeland Security. So... And you've been recognized for all the work that's been done in uh, various uh, forums. So I'm very tempted to ask you a question relevant to very relevant to your work experiences. Uh, how much does these uh, geopolitical conflicts actually impact uh, our supply chain? As we see today, Russia and Ukraine. Now, I don't know. Uh, um, I wish well, we had a crystal ball. So just a trigger thought on that. Well, first of all, um, thank you for having me, and I appreciate being honored with you, um, all, all the distinguished panel and, um, and RS. Um, to analyze, uh, I mean, to basically elaborate on what you ask, um, on the satellite communication with the supply chain, it's, it's going to be more of a... Um, how the data is moved, how the data, like for example, the State Department will allow data to go through the maybe the Singapore Chinese teleports, so everybody's still in data. Mm -hmm. So when it's relating to Ukraine and Russia, um, if the data for supply chains can be accessed, if it's mission critical. <coughs> If it's mission critical data, then satellite will play a major role in that in that in that uh, in, that, in that environment. Um, if it's just regular data going over, uh, a lot of it goes over the internet. If it's encrypted, um, then there might be some challenges. I just saw in the news where 
Russia was going to be blocking information from, I guess, Facebook or whatever coming into the country. If, I mean, I mean, I, I saw on the, the newscasters that they they're not they're not allowed to give a certain amount of information if it's relate something negative to the um to um, um to Russia. So they're talking about blocking the data from Facebook and whatever whatever other means that that um, that they're dealing with. But to go back to the supply chain, it's a matter of of what kind of data is being moved and how do you protect that? And how do you make it efficient? And uh, because my experience is 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 voice data and streaming video that that deals with aeronautical um land and mobile and maritime so how do you communicate that data without going through maybe because of the chinese teleports because they're still in data you have to move it through germany and europe or maybe australia the data there and to still be efficient to get you know the supplies that you know the people are looking for so that is that is a challenge that is a challenge and and um so um, but at the, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure that the customer and and is 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 basically being taken care of. That is that is the main concern and and how how efficient you can be. Um, but um, when it comes to the regulations with the government, that's a whole nother issue. And a lot of times, how I deal with it, I check with the State Department because I don't want to basically get into a situation where it's going to fall back on me. And, and so that's 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 basically where um well, uh, that's basically um some of the things that I'm doing at the present yeah. time. Okay. Thank you, David. I get back to you on some of the other aspects of what you talked about. Okay. I move back to Saurabh uh, in the healthcare space. That you know we've had last two years of crazy time of COVID impact on vaccine health, life, healthcare, whatever. What long term impact do you think has the pandemic had on the on the global health system and on the supplies and uh, do you think there's room to have collaborative approach because you're a tech uh, innovator in the health space and and that is paramount in everyone's mind that what happens again if something happens even larger yeah yeah i think it um i think covid really exposed and revealed some and, and several weaknesses in global health systems uh, from a, uh, a people power perspective and, and um, workforce perspective, as well as uh, tools. And then also um, really highlighted that, you know, even though we can get through vaccine development relatively quickly and, you know, as quick as we, we have ever in the history of uh, biotech, um, really just manufacturing scale up and then deployment and smart deployment of these uh, vaccines is really uh, what slowed us down. And that's really what's uh, really keeping us in this pandemic. Um, even though we were able to get that back to improve very, uh, very quickly or, or relatively quickly. Um, and we really need to patch up some shortcomings ahead of the next pandemic. Otherwise, you know, that'll take another several years to uh, dig ourselves out of there. Um, so as we saw with PPE in, in the U.S., uh, we couldn't have enough PPE to cover everyone. We need face masks, we need gloves, we needed uh, all sorts of disposable um, sanitary items and, and things like that. Um, so we had a number of uh, factories that were essentially shutting down and shutting down operations for whatever they were uh, making at that time and then converting over to PPE and then selling that back to either hospitals or, or health systems. Um, so really, uh, I, I think government with the on-demand manufacturing uh, is really critical for this. So being able to transition one factory to making PPE or making medical devices or making uh, medical, uh, you know, at, at, at that time, um, uh, uh, not not incubators, but um, uh, uh, education units and things like that were in high demand, and ventilators were were in high demand. Um, so yeah, being able to turn those on and off and and, and convert uh, existing manufacturing facilities and factories to uh, uh, pick up the slack there and continue uh, manufacturing those uh, it's very critical. Uh, and then I think we really underestimated how big you know, a global pandemic of this of, of this uh, magnitude would be, right? How much, how many vaccines? Um, the vaccine, you know, there's AI companies that made uh, molecules in just a couple of days. There's vaccine companies that were able to make a vaccine just within 46 days. That was actually the, the Moderna vaccine. Uh, but it took 10 months to get that through approval from day one of starting development and then all the way to, to final approval. 
And uh, the the fastest I've seen prior to that was around two and a half to three years. So, you know, did accelerate as quickly as possible to um, get that through approval. Uh, but then scaling that up, I mean, these are not easy molecules to scale, right? You have to make RNA, you have to make these lipid nanoparticles. Um, and really, even now, that's all happening. Um, at this point. So uh, a lot of those companies are bringing those manufacturing facilities in-house and they're, they're building their own uh, manufacturing facilities. I think on the, on the country scale, we did see uh, countries collaborating. Uh, there's a lot of support from non-governmental organizations, COVAX, Gavi, um, uh, CEPI, UNICEF, World Health Organization. Um, so a lot of them were concerned about uh, dis equitable distribution of these vaccines. So uh, really hard to tell if that's aligning with, you know, exactly their, their end goals. But I think just in the future, just closer scrutiny and measurements and, and monitoring of the collaborations of international uh, health agencies, as well as government and organizations, uh, really will help us, number one, emerge from this pandemic, but then also prepare us for future pandemics. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, that's an insight. I think uh, a preparation for the next one is inevitable. And, you know, we'll get back to you with, with that on another question on that. So, Deborah, I know that one of your key um, strategies has been in the past so many decades about um, advising your clients about anticipating change, right? And how do you profit from disruption? Uh, in these times, what we are seeing and if we had a crystal ball, uh, some of your uh, advice at this time to your clients would be, because we do see this yo-yo policy change, knee-jerk reactions all the time, political leadership talk loud, but markets work differently. So if you could crystallize some of the paths on the anticipation of this change and profiting from this disruption, Deborah. Thank you for the question. So it's really interesting in terms of, I would say, you know, as a, you know, let's say going into the end of the year, concerns over inflation, supply chain, labor. Come like January 15th, it's been 100% metaverse. And then as of about a week ago, kind of more on the geopolitical. But what's really interesting on the kind of whole metaversian aspect of supply chain, retail, production, technology, the entire intersection is this idea that if someone is buying something in the metaverse, so if you are in you know, kind of one of the different ecosystems, so whether it's you know, Decentraland, Sandbox, or Axie, that you're potentially buying right, three elements, and that could be a, a virtual element, a physical element, and a you know some kind of a loyalty token. And what's really interesting is that your expectations because you already have something you have the virtual rep you have the nft the virtual representation of the good and so you're like i have something right i've got it in my wallet i can show people and so then the anticipation for the thing itself right is there but there isn't this kind of i need it in two days type of idea so whether it's on-demand manufacturing or you know kind of a little bit more of a, a slow steam approach that has been incredibly I would say thoughtful around how some of these supply chains might change and ebb and flow. And then there's there's a few other kind of interesting data points if we piece them together. Target just reported almost 96% of their items were fulfilled out of their physical stores. And this idea that we can do more out of a physical box, right? We can not only fulfill e-commerce, we can you know, do buy online, pick up in store, we can fulfill the needs of our customers in the store. So, so stores start to, stores are more than stores now, right? They are pickup centers, they be live streaming centers, and that we can do more with the assets that we have. And we can also, you know, if you will, speed up some of the, the supply chain aspects in terms of getting the goods to the customers and the technologies around that. So where everyone had thought, you know, we were going to see a lack of investment in in-store tech. If anything, it's it's accelerated. So 2020 was all about e-commerce, looking at the tech stack. You know, kind of 21 was more about supply chain. What we're seeing this year, right? It's in-store techno technology, anything from a metaverse perspective, and then also this kind of continuous idea of just having one view of the customer. And retailers, pretty much across you know the U.S., had their best quarter ever in 4Q of 21 because the inflation that was in priced in hadn't necessarily come through yet. We saw un, you know, really unprecedented demand. And because of lack of labor, store hours were dramatically reduced. And it was this perfect storm for a great quarter. And so my prediction for this year 
is probably the greatest year ever, both in, you know, kind of software and hardware. A uh, big focus on robotics, right? Because we, we do have these kind of human capacity constraints right now. And that we are thinking more about this, this virtual, you know, kind of world and how they impact the physical and supply chain is very much a piece of that, especially if you think about, you know, blockchain and, you know, kind of tracking and tracing goods, making sure that they're authentic. And, you know, even just right, you know, it's like, as you, you watch your, you know, kind of car coming, you can watch your product coming. And, and this idea as well, that it's, it was made for me, I can track it. And a lot of work that we've actually done in India is how do you then kind of get back to the person who made your product and give them a tip, give them a, you know, kind of, you know, it could be an emoji, but this idea that you're starting to build unique relationships as a consumer across the world with your good. And all the while, this is really going to increase, I think this, the sustainability aspect of this industry because we will start to think differently about what we have, how we use it, and what the second or third life might be. So it'll be a tremendous year from that perspective. Thank you, Deborah. You know, in, in, in um, manufacturing processes, there was this word that we have used in the past for decades called traceability of what do you get in your hands, uh, raw material process, which production house, which lot, which date, which invoice. But what I see from you, is a, a, a very nice use of that technology of the emojis that you know if if someone has actually contributed anything to the product you you got and you get back to that person but with some recognition that's brilliant i think that's simply brilliant i think it's very satisfying very motivating and uh, you bring them as a stakeholder in your supply chain anyway so thank you for that that's a great point um George, uh, coming back to you because you are uh, you've been doing this for three decades, supply chain, thirty thousand products. You said, right? Um, at sixty countries, sixty percent U.S., Canada. You know, the supply chain is. I, if I had to say a word, the supply chain in the world is suffering from high blood pressure right now. <laughs> it's suffering from it's suffering from arrhythmia. Yeah. And and so my question to you is. Asia Pacific region in the world has been a hub for production capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fairly large, uh, especially for the U.S. markets, because most of these products find their way into the U.S. Uh, do you see that change? Uh, significantly. Look, minor things here. Significantly, do you think that there could be a model shift in that? No. The Asia Pacific production. I don't, I don't see uh, there's uh, any real change in that okay. way. So, so basically, um, well, there are, of course, the high-tech chips, you know, IC chips, medical stuff, uh, those high-value thing, you know, that, that, that that's, you know, there's some marginal, less globalizationable products that might move back. But for the majority, of the uh, uh, the, the uh, consumer consumable products and uh, uh, and uh, even technical product with a lot of uh, integration requirements, so I think that's 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 will be in Asia there. So regardless of in China or 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 uh, Vietnam or India, or, I think it will still be there. It is a part of the just for the integration. Let's say for one product, right? You have casting parts, you have a PCBA firmware, right? Metal, plastic, assembly. So that thing at the end of the day costs, let's say $50, right? Now, how can you transplant that even to Eastern Europe, right? That cost is going to be like 3x more. Like back to the US, it would be supposed to sell for $3,000, $3, right? Then the the life the life of that product will be ended, right? Because the product with the supply chain, the cost, it has its own eco life. If you move out of that, the price goes up 10x, then there wouldn't be a product anymore. So for loads won't be settled there. Yeah. For pretty long. Time. Got it. I got it. And maybe we'd see some uh, uh onshore assembly in the United States that 
you know, you could bring in parts, products, and assemble it, that value added. Yep. But the parts remain to be produced in the best efficacy wherever in the world as, as the market economy goes forward. Thank you, uh, George, for that. David, uh, in all this collaboration, production worldwide, supply chain, there's always this issue of intellectual property, the IP, and, and the fear of IP that uh, do I give this out to a production house or a collaborator? And this is actually a concern that I feel at times stifles open, uh, more collaborative economy. How, how serious and how do we mitigate this if at all? That's a good question. Um, because I deal on a satellite, and when it comes to security, intellectual property, how do you protect it? Um, I believe that in that arena, um, and like for example, I was bringing data out of uh, Afghanistan to the DEA. All that stuff had to be encrypted, had to be protected. So how how do how do you protect intellectual data um, on the satellite piece? It could be a number of things from how how you how you word it, how you patent it, how you patent your how, how you patent your your intellectual data. Um, and how you track it when you, when you, everyone was talking about the supply chain, how do you track your supply chain? And that's when this satellite piece comes in. Um, uh, from A point A to B, you have to be able to track your in, you have to be able to track your intellectual data via com, you know via communication. So where's the intellectual data going? If someone over in India snatch your intellectual data and using that for their own for their own gain, uh, you have to be able to track that. And so you have to set up your communication base, whether it's data voice or whatever, or streaming video, however your video is, to be able to track all that at real time. At, at real time. And that's the thing that that you have to be mindful of when you're putting that out there. And um that is i i'm partnered with mrsat and we're we're mrsat is a global uh satellite um each satellite costs about a billion dollars to launch and i can connect you 24 7 real time any place in the world so you have to be mindful of that that you have to track your intellectual property and secure it and know where it, know where it is at all times and i just need that thought there <laughs> Yeah, no, I know, I know, David. This is a a, a big issue, uh, and of course, in the defense and communication and satellite it becomes even more critical. But even for more industrial commercial products, uh, when people began to uh, think about outsourcing to multiple locations in Asia, Pacific, wherever, uh, there was always this undercurrent of what if this product uh, is no longer it's going to be my product in the future because there will be a competing brand coming out of that. So. You know, and people are managing that, but uh, this will remain a question and an enigma for businesses. Well, I see that we've got five, six minutes left. So I would I would uh, switch to each one of you, starting with Saurabh, that instead of going through a question, uh, if you could take a minute um, or, or minute and a half to, to summarize from all the thoughts we got at this time. Uh, on the subject of supply chain and the future. And as as the Horacius mentioned, that is this um, an easy way out to become more nationalist or whatever and create trade wars and, you know, and not be willing to sit across the table, negotiate better, open, transparent, collaborative networks. So, your key takeaway, uh, Saurabh, and then I would go to uh, Deborah and I'll go to George and David so that we can sum mm -hmm. up this thing uh, in the next few minutes. 
so maybe about a minute and a half. Sarah, over to you. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, COVID taught us a lot and, uh, you know, really uh, for the first time in, in a very long time, the entire world was against the virus and, and it really showed that we need to collaborate and work together to get out of this pandemic and we're still in many senses uh, not done with the, the pandemic. And you know, despite the vaccine being approved at lightning speed in just about 10 months, um, the manufacturing deployment of these vaccines has just been been proving to be incredibly challenging. Um, so the more collaboration we can get, uh, we we really need to be able to scale up these vaccines and really get this to billions and billions of doses um, almost immediately, right? Even before they're approved, there's only so much you can do uh, to accelerate the approval process. Um, but we can do a lot in manufacturing. I think BioNTech just released their uh, their local decentralized manufacturing where they can manufacture in, in shipping containers. Uh, they're deploying that to Africa, and we're really uh, seeing that there's be a lot of innovation from every every angle because this is not going to be the last pandemic uh, that we see. And actually, if anything, it's only going to get faster and faster and accelerate at the rate at which we see these pandemics. So, uh, as long as there's unvaccinated reservoirs and people in the world where uh, this virus can continue to mutate and reemerge with more virulent and contagious strains, I think we just need to heavily invest into collaboration and specifically manufacturing, deployment and monitoring and, and pharmacal vigilance and things like that, where uh, we can take all the learnings from COVID and really uh, finish out getting out of this pandemic and then also prepare for any pandemics in the future. Thank you, Sarah. Deborah, your key uh, thoughts and takeaways. I mean, I, I think that you know, from a cost perspective, there's an incredible you know ecosystem of startups. So whether it's a 3D look that can do virtual fit, whether it's Gerber that can do the cutting technology and help with kind of on-demand manufacturing, whether it's Cornet that does all the dye from a sustainability perspective, Momenta who can be this like platform for retailers to kind of like look around the world, ESW that does global kind of cross-border. And then, and many others. I just wanted to kind of, I mean, we we haven't, I mean, many of the companies I mentioned are kind of like new in the last few years, right? So we have this incredible ecosystem of early stage companies and some of them growing incredibly quickly who are looking to solve everything from, you know, like I said, from, from literally raw materials all the way to kind of last mile logistics. So we look at it as kind of first mile, middle mile and last mile. And I think that what we're seeing is, you know, AI is definitely playing a completely new role in how all of this is coming together and also accelerating investment as well as just kind of data and learnings. And so I think that we're getting smarter exponentially, but really, you know, this, this whole panel, it is really critical that we all work together because I think that is the only way we're going to be able to solve it. Thank you, Deborah. That was very well put. George, your your uh, summarizing keynotes. Yeah, so uh, this year for this moment on the global supply chain, or or right now, there are at least like uh, five major disruptions, right? You know, uh, impacting the global the supply chain ecosystem um, from the uh, COVID, you know, the uh, geopolitical, uh, the tariff, the raw material, the logistics. And so with all that, at this moment, um, I think most uh, companies, they really don't have a clear idea on what to do, just to try it out here. So that's why the GSMs, Global Supply Chain Managers, they are just uh, sleepless in the last couple of years until today. Um, they're still trying to find out what will be the solution. Uh, for all these from Fortune 500 companies I'm working with to the startups, they're all like, okay, what happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah this, this, this is kind of in that stage. You know, generally speaking, you have one disruption that's bad enough to come up with a plan. Right now, with all these disruption nonstop, right? So they are, you know, this it just overall, it's in that stage. I don't see that's going to be gone uh, in the short lead because with all these chaotic things going on day to day level. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. have a solution. <laughs> for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. No, I know this is, a, I wish we had a crystal ball, but we're all trying to figure out 
David, your last uh, few. Uh, yeah, my, okay, yes. You know, the power is, um, with um, every, what everyone has discussed, and including myself, um, we talked about AI, COVID, the, how things have changed, supply chain. And even with the current situation with uh, Ukraine, uh, probably a lot of infrastructure is out. So you take the AIs, uh, you take the COVID wherever it is, and you have to be able to communicate that efficiently to make sure that the supply chain, remote areas where there's where they need data to do uh, vaccines or whatever in the COVID side, or are you running artificial intelligence or whether it's remote uh, cars or whatever, you have to make sure that this communication is being is is going to be efficient. And that's where satellite technology comes in at. Satellite technology will make sure that all these things are running uh, together to make uh, to make make everything run efficient uh, to basically fulfill the customer and the supplier's needs, and that is that is important. Now, how do we collaborate to do that and make that more efficient? Which I think we're becoming better every day. Because if you might not see it, it may be your cell phone or you on an app, in some way or another is connected to satellite technology, and yeah. so you bring all of this together and make it run efficiently and that sometimes is a challenge but it, it can be it can be done that's i'll leave it at that okay thank you thank you thank you david and thank you guys i mean we've had good fun uh we're out of time and i the only thing is it's it was an honor speaking and getting your thoughts i think we should remain and stay connected and see what we can do as a small group in all that we are talking about it would be nice to to stay connected and uh, you know just keep our thoughts you never know what, what impact it might bring in some unknown area. So thank you. It was an honor. And you have a great evening. Get some sleep. Okay. Uh, get a glass of wine, whatever. <laughs> and I'm in the morning zone, so I have to do a lot of day work. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank nice you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Nice Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.